I'm Anton Hellman. And I'm Teresa Chan. And, and this, this is, is the, the Journal Jam, Jam Podcast. Podcast, where we blend interviews with leading researchers of important emergency medicine journal articles and the best of crowdsourced social media-based opinions of emergency medicine providers from around the world. Dogma is everywhere in medicine. I think a big part of this is because we learn by a lot of legacy teaching. And that's because when we first enter into medicine, there's so much to learn that you have to try to figure out some shortcuts and rules. But then once you get to the level that we're playing at where we're practicing physicians, we need to start maybe thinking about the dogma again and questioning a little bit. Yeah, when it comes to corneal abrasions, you know, I've been told countless times by ophthalmologists and even my ED colleagues never to prescribe topical anesthetics for corneal abrasion patients, with the reason being theoretical, really, that tetracaine and the like will inhibit re-epithelialization and therefore delay epithelial healing. Now, this might be true for the tetracaine abuser who pours the stuff in their eye for weeks on end, but, you know, when you look at the literature for toxic effects of using topical anesthetics in the short term, you know, for a couple of days after a corneal abrasion, there is a total of, ready for this, one patient from one case report. In other words, there's really no evidence for any clinical important detrimental outcomes when it comes to the short-term use of topical anesthetics for corneal abrasions. The question is, should we ignore the dogma and use tetracaine anyway? Another way to ask the question is, is there evidence that the use of topical anesthetics after corneal abrasion is safe and effective for pain control without adverse effects or delayed epithelial healing? So to discuss this paper called The Safety of Topical Anesthetics in Treatment of Corneal Abrasions, a review by Dr. Swaminathan, Otterness, Milne, and Rizei, it was published in the Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2015. We have EM cases Justin Morgenstern, a Toronto-based EM doc, EBM enthusiast, as well as the brains behind the First 10 EM blog. And we have Salim Rizei, clinical assistant professor of emergency medicine and internal medicine at University of Texas Health Sciences Center at San Antonio, as well as the creator and founder of the Rebel EM blog and Rebelcast podcast. We have no financial conflicts of interest to declare. This month, I'm really excited. I get to interview not only one of the authors of the paper we're discussing, but also a full med contributor and skeptic, the esteem, the rebel himself, Dr. Salim Rezaei. Salim actually participated in the very first journal jam looking at age-adjusted D-dimer with Dr. Jeff Klein. Salim, welcome back to EM Casey's Journal Jam. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate you asking me to talk about this paper. Now, this isn't one of those usual sexy topics in emergency medicine. How did you get interested in this question in the first place? Yeah, well, first, I got to thank all the contributors who helped me with this paper. You said it was a pretty impressive list. So Ken uh, Milne was on the list, Anand Swami Nathan, and then Kara Otterness all played an essential role in putting this paper together. And the way we got interested in this, it's just one of those things I was taught as a resident, and as I'm sure many were. Don't let your patients go home with topical anesthetics. They'll lose their eyes if you do. And honestly, I never really questioned it. I, I even remember my faculty telling me, hey, don't leave the bottle in the room. Take it with you because the patients will steal that and take it home and they'll come back and lose their eye. And if you actually go back and look in Tint and Alleys and Rosens, which are two of our Bibles in emergency medicine, and you look at what papers they cite to come up with that evidence, a lot of them predated the 1970s. They were animal studies, case reports, and case studies. And that's really what we're basing this recommendation off of. Now, I do want to spend a little bit of time sort of digging into the specifics of your paper. But before we dive in, can you just give me a brief one or two sentence bottom line here? Yeah, the bottom line was basically that uh, for patients who have simple, uncomplicated corneal abrasions, letting them go home with 48 hours worth of topical anesthetic and good follow up, these patients can control their pain and have no bad outcomes. So the bottom line, it sounds like, is that if you give a short course of topical anesthetics to patients who are going to get follow-up, that it might be okay? All right. So before we jump into the study, Dr. Morgan Stern and Dr. Rizé are going to talk about some important EBM stuff, which I think is really useful for all of us who look at systematic reviews. 
Although systematic reviews are near the top of the EBM pyramid in terms of strength of evidence, we still need to know how to interpret them rather than just taking the conclusions for, for their face value. So let's t- start talking a little bit about the methods. Now, evidence-based medicine and critical appraisal definitely seem to have a stigma, you know, as something difficult or unpleasant to do. But personally, I don't think that reputation is deserved. I think you can get a long way just using common sense. So what I want to do today as we talk about your methods is just run through four very simple questions that I ask myself when I'm trying to determine the quality of a systematic review. So the four questions we should ask ourselves to determine the quality of a systematic review are, number one, Is the review asking a question that makes sense and applies to your patient? Number two, did the authors find all the important studies on the topic? Number three, were the studies found by the authors any good? Number four, do the conclusions apply to me and my patients? So the first thing I ask is, is the review asking a question that makes sense and applies to my patient? That's sort of a screening question. If you're not asking a sensical or relevant question, I'm not going to waste my time reading the entire manuscript. Now, your study asks the question, what is the evidence for the safety and efficacy of topical anesthetics in emergency department patients with corneal abrasions? Yeah, that, that's a great question. It makes sense. It definitely applies to my patients, which is a good thing because otherwise we shouldn't be talking about it here. And if can I just add one thing there? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually uncomplicated corneal abrasions, and yeah. we'll talk about that a little bit later. So this isn't all comers. So I just want to be really clear, and we'll, we'll talk about what was excluded as we worked on this paper. Yeah, I agree. Let's move on. Let's hear what they had to say about that second question. Did the authors find all the important studies on the topic? Now, this is really important because the whole point of doing a systematic review is to find the literature, and missing studies could introduce systematic error or bias. So my question for you, Salim, is might you have missed any important studies? After we published the trial, there is one trial that did get missed. It was Ting JY et al., Management of Ocular Trauma in Emergency Trial, or the MOAT trial. Now, the reason this trial got missed is because it uses the word amethacane, which was not in our search strategy. Amethacane, by the way, is just another name for tetracaine. I will say, though, we did go back and look at this trial just to make sure that our systematic review was still good. And I really do think that this paper adds very little to our discussion. It was only 47 patients in this trial, but only 16 were able to be assessed for the primary outcome because they had a huge loss to follow up. So moving on, my my third question that I ask about every systematic review is, were the studies found by the authors any good? We often talk about the concept of garbage in, garbage out. If all the primary studies are biased, lumping them all together is not going to help us. So for your review, how would you rate the quality of the studies that you found? So as you can imagine, this is such a niche topic. There's just a real dearth of literature on this topic. As a matter of fact, there was only three emergency department trials and four ophthalmology trials, and none of them were large by numbers. And and what I mean by that is the largest trial by Waldman et al. was 116 patients. So here Dr. Rizé is going to explain why for this topic, we'll never be able to have big enough studies to have high quality, robust evidence. But based on what we do have, We've got some pretty good RCTs to help guide us. So I'll say that the trials included are higher on the evidence-based pyramid than animal studies, case reports, and case series, which is what a lot of our texts use. But if I could go back and do this again, I would do a formal rating of these trials, even though they had small numbers. Now, as a caveat, we did a review of this article on the SGEM with Chris Carpenter, and he actually did a calculation to see what it would take to achieve a 90% power of safety of topical anesthetics. He calculated that it would need 70,000 patients enrolled. And let's be honest, nobody's ever doing a trial that big on this particular topic. Yeah. But the nice thing about hearing that is the reason that you need a trial with such huge numbers is because the absolute difference is probably going to be very small. Absolutely. So we've talked about three of the questions to ask of a systematic review so far. Here's Dr. Morgenstern on the final and fourth question. So finally, the fourth question I always ask is, do the conclusions of this systematic review apply to me and my patients? So for example, if I was looking at a review of emergency department ultrasound and it only included studies done by experts in tertiary care hospitals, that might not apply to me in my community shop. 
So I do think that your review applies to the patients that I see every day, but some of the randomized control trials that you looked at were from the ophthalmology literature rather than the emergency medicine literature. Could you comment on how or if the difference in these patients might affect our interpretation? Yeah, absolutely. So we included four ophthalmology trials, which are called PRK trials. And I, I didn't even know what PRK stood for before I did this write-up. It actually stands for photorefractive keratectomy. Try saying that fast three times. <laughs> So simply put, ophthalmologists use a laser to ablate a portion of the corneal stroma, and it creates a sort of defect in the epithelium, which is functionally similar to a corneal abrasion. But this is a, a sterile procedure. And so I realized the lesion created is not exactly identical to a spontaneous corneal abrasion, but because the numbers are so small in ED trials, we thought it was really important to include this to help answer this core question. So now that we have a good understanding of what makes a systematic review a great systematic review, let's get into the meat of the study, the results. So there's two major objectives of your review. The primary question seems to be, are these medications safe? And then the secondary outcome of concern was, do they work? So let's start with a question that I think is easier to answer. What do your findings tell us about whether topical anesthetics are effective for pain control from corneal abrasions? Yeah, so to help us answer this, let's just focus on the two ED-based trials because that's really what we're doing every day. So in the Ball et al. trial, there was a statistically significant difference in the visual analog scale, which is a scale that goes from 0 to 10. And there was a mean improvement of 3.9 with propericane and 0.6 in the placebo group. In the Waldman et al. study, which was the largest trial, by the way, as we had mentioned before, there was no statistically significant difference in VAS pain scores. But when asked subjectively, patients stated that the topical anesthetics were more effective in relieving their pain. Now, I got to say, personally, I felt like the results of the Waldman paper were sort of surprising because anecdotally, it seems to me that a patient comes in with pain, their eye is killing them, they're having photophobia, they've got this abrasion. I put two drops in their eye and boom their pain is gone. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Obviously, topical anesthetics work. Anyone who spent any time in an emergency department has seen that in real time right before their eyes. But then we got to get to the real issue here. Am I going to erode my patient's eyeball by putting these drops in? What do your findings tell us about whether these medications are safe? Yeah, so it's important to state here that the trials that were included in the systematic review, they're all small, like I said. They're promising, but they're small. So in general, randomized clinical trials, they're not designed or powered to prove safety. And so it's hard to make blanket statements that these studies do prove safety. What I can say, though, for everyone listening is the key to the answer to your question is in the trials included, you really need to look and see what the exclusion criteria were so that you don't mistakenly give drops to somebody not included in this review. And if it's okay with you, I'm just going to quickly go through the exclusion criteria. Please do. Okay, so injury greater than 36 hours, previous eye surgery or cataracts, contact lens wearers, injury to both eyes, suffering from infectious or chemical conjunctivitis, grossly contaminated foreign bodies, herpes keratitis, penetrating eye injuries, injuries basically causing disruption of vision, unable to attend follow-up at 48 hours. So if you didn't meet any of these criteria and you only use topical anesthetics for 48 hours and you had good follow-up at 48 hours, based on this review, there was no cases of corneal damage caused by topical anesthetics. So I really want to emphasize that point again, because I hear people making the blanket statement that what we're saying is send your patients home with these bottles. And that's not what we're saying. So I want to emphasize that one more time. Simple corneal abrasions, look at the exclusion criteria of the review, 48 hours of topical anesthetics, and 48-hour follow-up. This is really the only blanket statement I can make from the, the studies that we reviewed. Let's emphasize here again which patients topical anesthetics are safe for. Those with an injury less than 36 hours, no previous eye injury or cataracts, no contact lenses, a unilateral injury, one eye, no chemical or infectious conjunctivitis, no grossly contaminated foreign bodies, no herpes keratitis, no penetrating eye injury, and no disruption of vision. And don't forget those patients who are able to follow up in 48 hours. So the bottom line is these are simple, uncomplicated corneal abrasions. 
All right, so let's move on to talk about how we can apply this to our practice. Say next week you're reading, uh, you know, a neurologist opinion on TPA and you slap yourself in the forehead in frustration and you miss. You get yourself in the eye. You give yourself a corneal abrasion. You come see me in the emergency department. Now, that's a little unlikely given that we're on opposite sides of the continent, but maybe you want to test out this amazing Canadian healthcare system you've been hearing so much about. <laughs> so I do a very thorough slit lamp exam and I confirm that you have a simple corneal abrasion and I reassure you that I expect this to heal quickly and without complication. Would you ask me to prescribe you a topical anesthetic? The short answer is yes. And when I so when I think about simple, uncomplicated corneal abrasions, in my mind, there's really three options uh, to treat the pain. There might be others, but I think realistically, there's three. Number one is topical anesthetics. Number two is topical NSAIDs. And number three would be some type of oral pain medication. And as we all know, corneas are very well innervated. It's a very painful thing for anybody to scratch their eye. And typically, we're sending people home with narcotics. Now, I know that the purpose of this journal jam is not to talk about topical NSAIDs. They do work. However, in the patient population that I'm seeing, they're very expensive. And there's many ERs who don't even have that as an option to give to their patients. Topical anesthetics, you'll pretty much find everywhere. And honestly, that leaves narcotic pain medications. And if you're prescribing the narcotic pain medication instead of a topical anesthetic, I can't drive, I can't work, I have the potential for addiction. So why wouldn't I ask you for the topical anesthetic? Of course, that's what I would want. Yeah, I'm with you there 100%. I feel like Almost every doctor that I know would use these drops on themselves. And so if you're willing to use a medication on yourself, you should probably at least be willing to have the conversation with your patient. Teresa, would you prescribe Justin topical anesthetics after he gave himself an uncomplicated corneal abrasion? There's a couple of factors, really, when it comes down to it. I'm not sure that I can safely prepare the dose of the tetracaine that I actually need. And I'm not going to be a pharmacist and kind of try to mix it up myself because as bound to cause complication and actually might cause infection. So I think that if you're going to be proceeding to do something like this, you probably need to have like a good discussion with your friendly ED pharmacist or local pharmacist that'll start mixing the formulation that you actually need to provide to your patients. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, I like to use the analogy of prescribing opiates to ED patients with pain in general. You know, I'll give morphine for home, but only for a couple of days as I recognize the potential for addiction problems if I give them like 30 or 40 Percocet, for example. You know, similarly with topical anesthetics for corneal abrasion, I'm convinced that using them short term improves their comfort. And at the same time, I recognize that if they take it for weeks on end at huge doses, they'll definitely run into problems. So I have started to give instructions to my patients for tetracaine, 0.5%, one drop every four hours for 24 to 48 hours after discharge using the same mini tetracaine dropper that I use for the same patient in the ED so that I don't have to worry about infection problems. And apparently I'm not alone. When I tweeted out the question to the foam world, do you prescribe outpatient topical anesthetics for uncomplicated corneal abrasions? Dr. Rapinder Saucy, an EBM enthusiast from Cambridge, Ontario, tweeted that he does the same thing with the tetracaine dropper that I do. And Dr. Rizé describes a method on Rebel EM where he dilutes the tetracaine to 0.05% solution in a 10cc syringe and gives that to the patient for home. But I agree that if you don't have something sort of formally set up in the emergency department or you're not giving the actual tetracaine dropper that you used for that specific patient for home, uh, that you really should set something up with your pharmacist to ensure safety and, and minimize infectious complications, et cetera. So here Dr. Morgenstern is going to give his clinical bottom line. And then we're going to talk about medical myths in general and how to deal with the consultants who might not be up on the latest literature. So myth busted. I think we both agree that the balance of evidence indicates that topical anesthetics will reduce pain and that although the evidence isn't definitive, there's little reason to believe that a short course will result in significant adverse events. Unfortunately, this really goes against the prevailing wisdom. This is a topic that ruffles a lot of feathers. I've seen both ophthalmologists and emergency doctors tirade about how giving drops these drops to patients is below the standard of care. 
So how do you go about changing your practice when you find that the evidence conflicts with usual care textbooks and guidelines? So the first thing I'd start by saying is I hear a lot of people say this, and I, I've been guilty of saying it too, say the phrase standard of care. That's actually a legal phrase. And I think what you're really trying to ask is about standard care, which is what we should be doing for our patients. And textbooks and guidelines are great for foundational knowledge and standard care, but they only get updated every so many years. And in the meantime, there's more research coming out that proves something different before the next iteration gets published. I can think of a long laundry list of things that we're already doing in everyday practice and good luck finding them in textbooks, but I suspect we'll be hearing about them and reading about them in the next five or 10 years. So examples include apneic oxygenation. Anybody who's anybody has heard of that, but you won't find that in any textbooks at this point. Delayed sequence intubation, running pressors through a peripheral IV, using age-adjusted D-dimers, and now maybe, and hopefully, topical anesthetics for uncomplicated corneal abrasions. Now, one specific problem we face as emergency physicians is that many of our patients will see specialists after us, either as inpatients or outpatients. So what do you do when your specialist colleagues disagree with your interpretation of the literature? So, Teresa, you've done a great piece in your medic series on the topic of dealing with difficult consultants for the Academic Life and Emergency Medicine blog. Let's say you prescribe tetracaine for your corneal abrasion patient who follows up with their ophthalmologist in a couple of days and the ophthalmologist calls you up and starts yelling at you, and you don't know what you're doing, and you're lucky that you didn't melt this patient's cornea, blah, 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 blah. How do you suggest we deal with that sort of situation? So I think that um, I would discuss with them my rationale for doing this. I'd kind of review what I was thinking, and I'd probably actually call them at the time that I was discharging the patient rather than try to debrief this afterwards once they'd received the patient. At my center, at least, we have to call the ophthalmologist to arrange follow-up, so that's a great time to have that conversation. And I'd point out that the dogma has these rules, but that there's a fair bit of literature out there that's starting to question this dogma and ask for their opinion. I would also invite this person to explore the topic with me and maybe invite them onto something like Journal Jam and have a podcast about it so we can discuss the merits of the evidence outside in the light of day. And finally, I think that if you really want to affect change locally, sometimes it's about putting that team together to look at creating an AD level policy and involving other disciplines like the pharmacists who actually can mix up the right formulation that you can send the patients home with. I think that that often diffuses the anger and also invites the consultant to participate in kind of anticipating these needs, that we can create a system of care that's better for our patients. Some wise words said. Let's hear how Dr. Rizé deals with the specialist colleagues who disagree with his interpretation of the literature. Yeah, so, you know, this is a tough one. And uh, I think just like we do in foam, it's all about creating a community and starting a conversation. So the most effective thing that I've found is if two different specialties disagree on a particular subject, The best thing that I have found is to create an interdisciplinary conference, invite the ophthalmologist to do a grand rounds, let them explain why they don't like using it, and then have the ED docs explain why they do like using it, start the conversation between the departments, and then figure out what works at your institution. Everywhere is not exactly the same, and the things that we do at one institution may not work at another institution. But the bottom line is, is why argue? At the end of the day, we're all just trying to do the same thing, and that's take care of patients without causing harm. That's incredibly good advice. We all want the best care for our patients, no matter what our specialty. These these medical myths are a topic that really fascinate me. I always try to encourage the medical students and residents that I work with just to be curious. It's amazing the things you'll find if you're just willing to ask the question, why? So, Teresa, what do you think the future holds for pain management and corneal abrasions? I think the future is going to be pretty great. There's two ongoing trials that I know of. First of all, they're going to be pretty large, probably not 70,000 patients large, like the power calculations that Chris Carpenter had made previously. But I, I do think that these may hold some promise in answering our question. 
The Waldman group is actually doing a larger observational study that is going to speak to more to the safety question, because often for safety and harm studies, you actually need a much bigger study. So they're working on that right now. And I do believe that Ian Ball in Kingston is running another randomized control study that will be the biggest that we've had so far to answer the efficacy question. Yeah, I'd like to see a study that compares tetracaine with other meds, especially topical NSAIDs, which have been shown to be effective for pain relief in corneal abrasion patients in a 2005 meta-analysis, but as you were saying, are quite expensive, much, much more than tetracaine, uh, or a comparison to oral analgesics for that matter. Well, that about wraps it up for this month's Journal Jam podcast. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Journal Jam today, Salim. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much to Dr. Morgenstern, Dr. Rizé, and you, Teresa, for all your wisdom. With that, let's leave listeners with our take-home message. Let's keep on jamming on the Journal Jam. Remember, you don't have to nerd out alone. Together, we're smarter. smarter.